Uh, so we're a company out of Melbourne, Australia. Am I on? Yeah. Get closer. Yeah. Uh, we are here with our game, a goose game. It's a game about a goose. Yeah. Doesn't have a name. Um, some would say doesn't need one. <laughs> Um, it's, it's good enough for paintings and songs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good enough for a game. Uh, so, yeah, we're four friends who started making video games three or four years ago now. Uh, and now here we are. <laughs> um, yeah, we made a video game. How's this microphone distance? I'm not very good at that. Seems fine. Um, we made a video game called Push Me, Pull You, uh, which came out last year. Uh, we started it not really know what, knowing what we were doing, and I don't know how far we've come. Um, we, uh, it was at this very festival uh, three years ago uh, in 2014. It was our very first festival ever. We were scared little babies. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing, as I mentioned. Uh, and now we're grown-up babies <laughs> <laughs> who know how to make video games. Look how far we've come. Uh, and yeah, Ned, that's enough of that. We are now making this game. Uh, it's about a goose. Uh, and I guess I wanted to start out just by talking a little bit about why we decided to make this particular video game, why a game about a goose seemed like a good idea. Um, and so to do that, I'm going to step you through our like original design brief when we sat down at the drawing board to figure out what our like big follow-up would be. Uh, and so here is that document. Right. Is um, it okay if people take notes and? <laughs> um, oh, well, don't share this around. Yeah. Uh, okay. This is this kind of internal stuff. <laughs> okay, so this is confidential, mm. everybody. <laughs> uh, so at 10.50 p.m. at night, uh, is this still on? Yeah. Uh, Stuart uh, posted this uh, stock photo of a goose that appealed to you. Yeah, this is lots of work here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, said that we should make a game about it. Uh, and then the rest was history. Well, at first, just silence. Radio <laughs> silence. <laughs> just several hours. <laughs> Until 8.26 a.m. when he just jumped back into it. <laughs> uh, Unperturbed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, game development is about sticking to your convictions <laughs> and, and knowing when you're onto a good thing and really pushing for it. Uh, so he sort of kicked us off uh, by letting us know what the best part about a goose is, which is the little bit above their nose, uh, and then we talked for a very long time about that. Uh, and we talked about it a lot. Uh, and so I'm just sort of... Ja Jake was asleep, I think. Jake was asleep. He slept in that day. We'll get back to that last slide. We'll get back to that last slide. I'm just going to step everyone through just sort of what appeals to us about geese. Uh... I hope this is instructional. Uh, so let's let's get started. Here's yeah. that goose. Yeah, there it is. Uh, you can kind of see where we're going already. You get yeah. what the appeal was. <laughs> so just to kick off, like Stuart mentioned, uh, it's the bit above their nose. Do you have any comments? Uh, it looks weird. <laughs> it's like a little bump. Mm, very funny. Uh, and then I counted uh, with that maybe actually the best thing was their big chest because it sort of pokes out a bit and then goes concave underneath. What do you think that feels like? I've got a concave chest, so it feels, right. it feels great. <laughs> I can see I what you like it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also their feet. Oh, that's also <laughs> the best thing, yeah. <laughs> You've just counted yourself there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, they've got little creases on their ankles there, like uh, they've got too much skin or maybe it folds up. Mm. Nice rubbery yeah. mm. texture. One important fact about goose feet actually is that if you own a pet goose, um, I think they have very delicate feet. Uh, so if, I guess if you own a pet goose, you need to get these like custom really good sandals they actually look like it's wearing sandals and socks like human sandals yeah uh, i think to like protect from like concrete because maybe they're not used to walking yeah it's bad for them to walk on hard ground mm. but with sandals it's okay so it's a little goose foot fact for everybody uh where were we sorry for that diversion 
<laughs> uh, honking noise. I will get to that one. Doesn't need much later context. On. Yeah. Um, so uh, my partner Nina jumped in uh, that they have very little tails, which I thought was a really good observation. And I was a big supporter of that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a very big bird, um, <laughs> but not a big tail, which is a funny portion. <laughs> the proportions are a bit weird. It, I think that contributes to them seeming a bit like kind of a, a little person or something. It's a very interesting contrast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't expect that from a bird that big. <laughs> uh, and so I sort of wanted to hear out, you know, both sides of, of geese. Like, we can't all just talk about what the best part is. Uh, so the worst part probably, hypothetically, is they probably have tiny little teeth. And this is a big one. They, they do, it turns out. He, yeah, he I know, right? right? <laughs> Um, and it's not just teeth. Just take a look at that tongue. Yeah. <laughs> the teeth has tongue as well. <laughs> or the, the other... The <laughs> mm. And the tongue has teeth. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you have any Hard photos of a goose that's not cursed? <laughs> uh, no, actually. <laughs> it's mostly cursed geese, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are actually... Uh, Grandpa's dentures. There's a real caper that happens. Yeah, it's not good, huh? Uh, and then we sort of rounded it out by talking about the beak, which frowns always. <laughs> uh, and the observation was made that they're always cross. And then there's sort of, you know, this classic dichotomy of how mm. ducks are happy and geese are cross. And we sort of thought that summed yeah, it up. It's, it's inbuilt into the bill, whether they're happy or cross. Uh, and I think we really like this idea that geese are always cross. They're like, there's this cultural understanding. Everyone agrees that geese are just sort of the worst. They have this, they have this very particular personality. Yeah. They're a and bad animal. Yeah. A and a reputation for that. Uh, and everybody agrees. Here's a couple of headlines. They're pretty rough. Don't write like this. Yeah. They can't help it. It's in their nature. Uh, this was on Twitter a few days ago. A okay, I'm not sure how real this one is. But yeah. Uh, a really good thing about making a game about a goose is that if anything to do with a goose happens anywhere, then we immediately are told about it by lots of people. <laughs> so it's good to be on top of that. Um... What else we got? Oh, yeah. This was sent to us by an email a few days ago. This was fr locally from the El Paso Herald in 1920. Does anyone want to read this headline out? Uh, goose blocks traffic. Police wagon called. Bird lands in city jail. Uh, so, yeah, there was this large fat goose that was arrested here for blocking traffic because it was wandering around the residence district honking merrily. <laughs> and that wouldn't stand. Uh, automobile party stopped to watch it. The streetcar line was blocked and the police called the patrol wagon. The bird was given a lodging in the city jail. So yeah, we were like very, I guess, fascinated by this idea that geese are these like really aggressive, vindictive animals that sort of just exist to ruin people's day. Um, and they're not dangerous or scary in the way that like a tiger is. They're scary in this really mundane way. Yeah, we've talked a lot about this, about how you're never going to encounter an actually <coughs> dangerous animal, probably, in your everyday life. But you might encounter this one who's just like a bit vindictive or like... It's just socially to, bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad in the way a person's bad. Yeah. <laughs> These are hooligans. <laughs> uh, and so that was kind of... Yeah, that was, that was where we ended up when we decided to make a game, I guess. We sort of had this one sentence. Uh, and then the rest was history. Um, is that all our slides? That's all our slides. So we're done. Yeah, video yeah. Game. yeah, let's open up the video game. Who wants to see a video game? Thanks. Um, so here's the video game. As you can, I'm going to do my favourite joke now. As Everyone you can ready? see, 
it's a video game about a regular gardener who's having just a normal day, uh, really minding its own business, thinking about a watering can. Is that the, the end of the joke? No, they're walking over to the watering can uh -huh. and they're going to pick it up and I guess it's just a game about this gardener. Oh, oh hang on, it's a game about a goose. That was pretty good, huh? Um, yeah, so our, I, uh, our starting point, I guess, was to make a game about a goose, to make a goose. Uh, before we started building out a world um, or like figuring out, you know, what, what like the structure of the game would be, what its mechanics were, its systems, etc. We sort of knew we needed to make a goose that was fun to control on its own. Uh, and more than like, we had this very specific idea about wanting to like embody its essential gooseness, its its goosicity uh, through its through its controls, um, through what you can do. Um, so we made sure, first of all, that there was like this nice waddly walking animation. Uh, we wanted you to be able to like crane your big long neck around. That's good stuff. Uh, you can flap your wings, and you can like flap them a lot. Uh, and also, we'll call back to earlier, you can honk. Uh, and you can also do all of them at once. Um, can I give the insider info about that honk? <laughs> we've, we've got a lot of emails yeah. saying that that is actually a quack. Uh, well, it was taken from an audio file, <laughs> which was titled Goose, Geese Honking. And we kind of scrubbed through most of it and we're like, oh, these sound really bad. And we chose the one that sounded great, which was this one. And then later looked at the description of the like free sound or whatever, which said, oh, there might be a duck in there somewhere. <laughs> Has anyone seen a goose before? I think Out of so. us before? Yeah. Yeah? Probably. Um, <laughs> coming here, we realized everyone in the Northern Hemisphere seems to know about geese. <laughs> we thought they were just like in cartoons or something. Yeah. Like. <laughs> <laughs> this is like mythical animal to us. <laughs> it's very embarrassing being asked by a bunch of journalists whether like what our worst goose experience is or something like that and having to be like, oh, um. Pelicans. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have them. <clears throat> um. So the other half of the design was that you're a goose who's horrible to people. So we had to make these people to be horrible to. That was like the other half. We made a goose, we had to make people. Um, so there is a person here, but we'll have to find them. They're inside. So I'm gonna get Stuart to like lure them outside. I won't talk too much about all this stuff, but once the person's around, we can take a look at them. There they are. So Stuart's lured them out by turning on a sprinkler. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our philosophy here was just to make these people as reactive as possible. Um, so for example, they like to watch you if you go near them. They, they just kind of have a, a passive interest in, in you. Um, yeah, if, if they hear a noise, they'll try and work out where it came from, so that's why they turn around if you honk. And, like, if you're hiding, they might go to where the noise came from and scratch their head because they can't see what it was. Um, and if you get too close to the people, they'll push you away. We kind of see it a bit like when Mario's on fire, if that makes any sense to you. <laughs> <laughs> kind of <laughs> runs off without you being able to control it. Um, and above just like kind of honking at them and flapping at them and generally kind of running at people and being a nuisance, we wanted to make some way of interacting with the people. Um, we wanted to make kind of a symmetrical action that you, both you and they perform. So to do that, we added these items to the game. So it's full of little props, like this watering can. So you can pick up the watering can and move it around and so can they. And that kind of made this language for you to communicate with the human characters in the world. Um, the very first system we made was this one of tidying up. So that's why when you move something out of place, if they notice, they'll pick it up and put it back again. Um, 
So you kind of become this agent of chaos who's always trying to make a mess. And they're always trying to restore order back to the world and put it back to how it was before you got there. Um, we kind of like that as a basis for the conflict in the game. So you made a big mess now, but I don't know where they are then. <laughs> Normally they'd come clean it up, but I guess they're busy like playing around with their trail in the dirt. Yeah, so if you honk, you call them over and maybe they'll, they'll see the mess and eventually they'll come back and clean it up. Uh, they're a bit slow, but... <laughs> Eventually, they'll clean up that mess, I think. Um, we also wanted to make some objects a bit special. Um, so we made some uses for some of them. So that trowel that the gardener just picked up before and has now put down again, um, they like to use that to do some work. They trail around in the dirt. And I think we mainly like that just because it kind of adds this like extra layer to the joke. Not only if you hidden something that belongs to them, um, you're now depriving them of being able to do their labor or something. Yeah, it's it's so it's infinitely funnier to bother someone whose job it is to put up with you than it is to just like. Yeah, they're not your babysitter. They're trying yeah. to get some work done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're very much in their way. Is now a good time to show the panda video? <laughs> yeah, right. Here's a big touchstone for us. Yeah. So, um, I don't know exactly when we figured it out, but we kind of had to make this character. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're trying to get something done, but they kind of have infinite patience for these <laughs> nuisance animals, or nuisance animal. Um, and we think that this person is maybe exactly like our gardener. at work right now. <laughs> it's like a Thursday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's probably like pretty hungry. <laughs> so she, she never gives up. Like she has to do this job. It's just hard because there are pandas everywhere. How long does it go for? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, there's something about dealing with a nuisance that uh, lets things never really escalate. Like this woman just has to put up with these pandas for as long as it takes. <laughs> yeah, they don't get put in panda jail or anything. Yeah, she has no recourse. She has to, <laughs> she can be smart and like try and distract them or something, but there's, there's no way out of this situation for her. She really, the pandas have to be here and she has to get all these leaves out. <laughs> <laughs> they don't seem to have any motivation for this. want the thing that she wants, no matter what. Should we go back to the video game? <laughs> I love the big audience watching her as well. <laughs> they know that's good. I think she just tricked she him. Makes it back in. Let's find out. Tricked him. So yeah, that's kind of what we're hoping it's like dealing with this goose. Show him, Stuart. Well, yeah. So like the game kind of became a bit of a like a stealth game like like the, the mechanics that were emerging were 
we, we had this kind of system where you would create chaos and we get cleaned up and that was fine but there wasn't the kind of like malice that that panda video I think especially has like, there wasn't the kind of like you're, you're inconveniencing someone but you're not really like ruining their day or anything like that um, so I think <laughs> ha having these kind of more stealth game mechanics really lent itself to the game not only in terms of just like what it would be fun to do as a goose um, but also just the fact that if you're going to make a stealth game, we, we can make the one where it doesn't always have to escalate into violence or fail states or anything like that. Like, just like that woman, you always have to put up with this nuisance. You can't, there's no kind of way around it. You can't kill the goose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't shoot the goose. <laughs> um, so we also tried to make a bunch of objects have special things going on. Um, oh, this flower's got something special. Um, this flower, when they put it back, they like to replant the flower. Um, so that kind of gets them to look away. And maybe if you're lucky, you can like steal the keys or something. <laughs> um, and the keys are a bit special too because they live on the garden of themselves. Um, I think the reason why we had to do that is because originally we were kind of like, oh yeah, there'll be all these items that are kind of harder to steal. Um, and we weren't quite sure what that meant. We thought maybe like, oh, in a video game, you might have a guard, guard a doorway, and then what's inside that room could be the the big loot that you really want or something. Um, but that didn't really work because this game just has one character in this garden. Um, so all you have to do is wait for them to walk away and then you can go any way you like. So we decided to make the like special items, the ones that you really want to steal that are kind of hard to get, just live on the gardener themselves. That way, uh, any time that you want to take them, you always have to go up to the gardener. It's like rather than putting the gardener out, guarding the thing, uh, you go to them. Uh, I think the other kind of thing that was really informing our design when we were thinking about this was it was not so much what kind of emerged naturally, but like our preconceptions of what we wanted to make after Push Me, Pull You. Um. <laughs> Lucky not. Oh. <laughs> Close to go there. Uh. Um, so yeah, like kinda, as, as we were showing before... Huh? Yeah, yeah. So kind of as we were showing before, with just like the Goose's verb set, I guess... Um, the, the kind of very few goals we had coming out of Push Me, Pull You was that we wanted to, I guess, work in 3D, uh, work in third person. We wanted to have like a real character-based game that was very focused around you uh, almost performing as something. Um, a lot of the conversations we were having at the time was like how nice it was to kind of puppeteer this character. And like a lot of the games we were talking about, like maybe like um, Mario 64 was the, the one that kind of came up most. Uh, <laughs> uh, not, not so much in terms of like platforming or, or whatever but just the idea that you have this little funny character who can be very expressive um, and, and can like perform a lot for the camera with, with even like a limited amount of inputs um, yeah just a, a game where it feels nice to be a character yeah. in a, like a really versatile and interesting way yeah. in, in the way that in Mario 64 You've got an Nintendo 64 controller, but you can like do six kinds of jumps. You can dive th like mid jump through the air. Or, or yeah, you can have all these different states. Like if Mario's crouching, from there there's like three other things you can do or whatever, mm. all of which are kind of different and expressive. Um, and yeah, before we'd even even come up with the idea of the goose, that was something we were kind of thinking about. I think part of that came from just the fact that Push Me Pull You being a local multiplayer game was kind of very tightly constrained. Yeah. We, we knew from very early on, like, oh, it's going to take place in this small ring and, like, it's going to be very purely about these bodies. Um, and after that, we kind of were like, oh, we want to, like, all experiment and do different things, but we want a game that is kind of easy to experiment in, something that's kind of quite broad and a bit loose, um, and we can kind of go off and just add whatever we want and throw it in. So making something that... It's almost like a tiny open world, like a very sandbox thing, just meant whatever we felt like working on after Push Me Pull You, we had like this place to put it in. Um, so we actually did an experiment making kind of a tiny third person character game um, while we were thinking about things like Mario 64. This was like a month before we started working on The Goose. Yeah, this is the, pro the, the 
preceded the goose by a tiny bit. So instead of making a game about someone or a thing that was yucky, we wanted to make a game about the nicest little boy in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that boy, Jack? Oh, Who's that? Stu, this is Pinola. Introduce me to this boy. Uh, he's got a nice little red hat. Mm -hmm. uh, he's still just two colours, mm -hmm. mm. just like a goose. Uh, red and white this time. Um, uh, he's a bit cheeky, but only unknowingly. He'd be conned into something, I mm -hmm. think. Um, and he just likes to run around. <laughs> he's got a maze. <laughs> yeah, so this was our attempt at just like making... I, I think originally we, we'd, we'd planned to make this kind of... It, it was just about puppeteering, which I think is where we kind of like landed on this kind of Pinocchio-like character. So he could... He had a bunch of little verbs, like he could sit down, I think. If you press, yeah. Hey. Um, and if you run and press sit, he would do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, the, the kind of idea behind this was that we'd have all these verbs that kind of fed into each other. They'd always like, all, the, all these weird like con context sensitive, like maybe you'd sit and then you'd move forward and you'd roll around or, or do something like that. Or if he was lying down face, face first, if you rolled around then, he would roll around in a bit of a cone kind of shape. Um, but yeah, trying to get that kind of expressivity, um, it's very hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it, it's, it's hard, but it also, it, it didn't, we worked on this for maybe like a couple of weeks or something and it just never really, a, a design beyond, it wouldn't, wouldn't it be funny to puppet this guy mm. never kind of emerged. Uh, I don't think we really had any ideas of what this person would do apart yeah. from be Pinolo. Yeah. Um, mm. so I think that's. When we were like, hey, remember that stock image game that we joked about being a game that we'd work on? <laughs> what if we really did that one? And I think um, when you grow up in Australia, you grow up with a bunch of English television. Mm. Um, oh, so this is kind of influencing the Pat setting. Pat, yeah. Postman Pat, Postman Pat, and his black and white cat. This is the kind of thing that we grew up on as kids. Um, Early in the morning. You know, Weird. Just as day as is dawning, life. he picks up um, all the what we thought in his van. <laughs> yeah, there might be a goose in here somewhere. Pat, Pat, um, probably. <laughs> That's what they're like over there. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's this lovely thing about all of these shows. Um, kind of quite provincial and uh, quite cartoonish and full of these very um, archetypical characters. Um, whose like, job sort of defines their whole being. Um, and I think we were pretty drawn to that in the goose, and we started working with this idea that uh, had this image of this goose invading this town fair, um, like this massive uh, event full of people um, all having their little jobs and things to do, and you as the goose were this agent of chaos like, entering this space and just causing havoc. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is that how that starts? <laughs> <laughs> this is the first ever Thomas the Tank Engine. Um, and we were watching this show called Brum, which is about a nice little car. It's a magic um, car. Yeah. Uh, Brum's a magic car. <laughs> and there's this fantastic thing of just, yeah, all these, all these great characters. Um, we wanted... <laughs> We wanted like a village of these people uh, that the goose would sort of invade. Um, and we're working towards this very lofty, lofty thing. Um, yeah, so we already decided what we're making. Open world, sandbox, uh, yeah. big human characters who are very interactive. Yeah. And we'll have hundreds of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> It'll take like a year to make. <laughs> uh, and as we're working towards that, we um, kind of realized that that was pretty, a pretty full on goal to start off with. Um, and yeah, we had this space, like this garden, um, that was much bigger than what's in the game right now. Um, and we had a gardener and a few other people, uh, and it just was a bit of a mess. And like, they would, they would know when you took their stuff and they'd go and get it and bring it back. Um, but the size of the space, um, just kind of wasn't that fun. Um, and like we pared it down. I think the biggest moment for me was actually um, I made the goose look at stuff that was nearby. I made it look at the gardener. Um, it originally just had its head pointing, you know, dead center, yeah. dead straight. Um, 
And then as soon as the goose just uh, like targeted to the gardener, it created this, like instantly created this really quite funny relationship. Like you do things and the gardener would react and this goose would just sit there looking at him. Um, like it immediately created all this <laughs> life in this thing and sort of uh, stopped it from just being this thing that you puppet to being this kind of animal that was a little bit alive. Um, and yeah, we started to realize, as you said, that uh, kind of stealth mechanics and that sort of space started to feel right for what we were doing. Um, so we started to make things more constrained and give, uh, like, we gave it this potato plant to hide in and just a bunch of different obstacles to get around and, um, like, yeah, all these different spaces that you could move through um, and to kind of facilitate that uh, stealthy kind of thing. Um, and I think because <laughs> stealth games are already kind of comedy games, um, like the things that you do in a hitman, the the big uh, assassinations, I guess, uh, often sort of read like practical jokes. Yeah, um, you're setting up these like traps essentially that yeah. will will play out in a way that you mm. want them to. It's just that at the end, someone <laughs> gets electrocuted or something. <laughs> Um, yeah, they all depend on like farce and dramatic irony. Yeah. It's all about you as the player having like more information than uh, the the people in the game. Um, um, yeah, which in this case ends up feeling like dramatic irony, uh, and like yeah, it has a lot of things that are very close to kind of comedic beats. I think. <laughs> um. I think in lots of ways, um, having an animal as the playable character has made it a lot easier to make this believable human character. If these sorts of situations ever happened between two people, I think they'd be quite extreme. Like even in this mundane setting, like if I went into your place of work and started just like picking up everything. If you put someone's rake in the lake. <laughs> throwing it on the ground. Um, <laughs> like you'd probably get mad at me and you'd have to express that in a way that's either quite nuanced or alternatively quite violent um, if it was anger or something and I think that is part of the reason why it always seems a bit absurd when like you try and put this believable character in your video game and then like the player walks in and they're like jumping on the table and just making a mess and they're trying to make it seem normal mm. um, that never quite works whereas the range of reactions that we could do as a small team kind of fit better with the range of reactions that someone might have to an animal. Um, yeah. So it's both like being an animal fits better to what you can do with a controller, but also just has this like narrow range of responses where they're like, oh, it's, it's a bother, but it's here. <laughs> like and I think because, because it never escalates to like killing the goose, um, uh, it creates this really resilient relationship that uh, just, yeah, the, the gardener puts up with everything you throw at him. Mm. Um, and I think that forms this quite interesting space to have a game that has this relationship in it. Um, <laughs> that uh, it is not necessarily like a capital R relationship game, but like nothing, nothing of worth happens in this game without that relationship in there. Um, which I think is kind of cool. So the other thing that we've got, apart from props, is these little switches everywhere as well. So, like, um, if you turn a tap on, eventually, if they can hear that one, I think that one's not very loud, so they don't hear it, but, oh, they're actually in a good spot. If I can get this. Ha, <laughs> um, So these switches, they're both used by um, the gardener and the goose as well. So again, there's, like, a symmetrical system that lets the communication happened both ways. Um, in the case of this radio here, uh, it's both a switch with its effect of playing music. It might be a bit quiet right now. Um, <laughs> where's it going? Oh, the water's on still. <laughs> yeah, they have funny priorities sometimes. Um, um, so they're kind of the, the tools that we get to use. It's like these switches and props. Big part of making a good comedy stealth game is that your NPCs are allowed to be dumb. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
They can yeah. run around all day. No big deal. If a guard did this, it'd be a bit weird. But this, they just work here. Um. <laughs> Yeah, again, that tap's still on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to the tap. Um, is that our entire game? Um, uh, I made some questions. I, I mean, I know the audience has questions, but I wrote questions for all you three as well. <laughs> oh, and I wrote questions for you as well, Nico. <laughs> What's yours? I uh, called his bluff. Uh, I'll, I'll say mine after yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask who came up with these little lines that are everywhere in the game. I think me. I think I think the first thing we sort of yeah we're working in this very like uh, this this graphical style which was a, a big pile of polygons with this very flat shaded aesthetic um, and uh, I was a bit nervous that uh, that that was that is sort of becoming this kind of house style um, and so I wanted to give it some sort of I don't know just like uh, cartoonish crunchiness. I want to feel graphical in the way that like a newspaper strip comic is, is graphical. Um, and so, yeah, there's sort of these like little white scribbles dotted around the, the whole thing, um, which is one, like a very like easy shorthand for like giving insight into how these mechanics work. But also I think just, just give it this uh, kind of layer of cartoonishness that I think lends itself to this uh, like cartoonishly comedic game. Does that answer your question, Nico? <laughs> it does. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and I think once we kind of developed that style a bit, um, it became really useful as like a way to kind of do UI that's in the world. So like the little lines um, to highlight when you can pick something up. Um, how did you describe that? It's like in a cartoon when they want to show that someone's like holding nothing. Yeah, well, yeah. if someone in a cartoon released a big silver platter, but <laughs> there was nothing under the silver platter, there'd just be a l few little lines. That's what cartoons look like. Yeah. Um, and it also let us put like a big drawing on top of the gardener's head about the thing that they're thinking about. Yeah. Um, which really helped because they're kind of complicated. Like They have a lot of different things that they need to respond to and do. And it can become really hard to keep track of like, what's got their attention now, why are they walking over there? Um, but if they're scratching their head and there's a picture of a carrot, you know it's because they're confused about the carrot. And then you get to use that information to manipulate them. Did you have any other questions, Nico? Uh, I do, but I reckon the crowd will have better ones. All right. You hope. <laughs> yeah. yeah, can we throw it open to questions? Hang on one second. Last month, you guys got quite a bit of coverage uh, when the footage came out under as Untitled Goose Game. Have you considered just leaving it Untitled Goose Game since... Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Wouldn't that be easy? Yeah. Uh, and it also seems like it fits in kind of a meta way. Can you expand on that? It's fucking funny. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's the meta. <laughs> um, yeah, we... We were saying how, like, I it's very easy to get a bunch of, like, tweets responding to your trailer or whatever when, like, everyone just wants to suggest a name for your game. Because that's, like, it's kind of the one bit you could actually tweet at someone that they could actually use as a part of their video game. So we'll be calling our game Metal Goose Solid. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, I haven't heard that one yet. Mm. <laughs> I bet you guys only got one of those total. <laughs> Actually, quite, quite, quite a lot of people said that. <laughs> how, uh, how long did you spend working on this prototype? And please say six months or less, otherwise, or say six months or more, otherwise I'll just cry forever. <laughs> like, how long have we been developing this? Yeah. It's almost, almost exactly a year. Oh, yeah. thank God. Like okay. Yeah. Very, okay. Very part-time for Great. about a year. Great. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you consult with a lot of goose attack victims uh, when <laughs> thinking about like what type of subject matter to put into this project? <laughs> um, 
Oh. I like, I, I, I feel like we, we are really only just realizing now that geese are a part of people's lives. <laughs> uh, and maybe we haven't handled that with such sensitivity. Um, I can say we're kind of, we're rectifying that now. We're, we've got an invitation from a friend of ours who works at a children's farm, like near our offices, who's invited us to come and have a little field day with the, with the geese. So maybe we'll get some kind of first-hand experience. So notice the, the uh, gardener kind of oh. disregards whenever you drop a carrot into the basket. Is there any kind of hidden functionality of helping the gardener? Being, being the friend of the goose, or the friend of the gardener. A black swan, <laughs> <say. laughs> um, So yeah, this, this is something we have like kind of disagreements about a lot, I think, is um, the, the idea, like, how helpful can you be as this this creature of mostly malevolence. Like, uh, should there be opportunities for you to <laughs> to actually help out or, or be kind of like friendly sometimes? Um. Go in the, go in the hedge. We'll just take a little moment here for yeah. this to resolve itself. can't help but notice the the genuinely worrying intelligence of this malevolent goose and and I have to and, and I have to wonder what's his end game does he want money power uh, the destruction of humanity at the moment he wants a p pretty specific uh, list of things <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> and he's making real headway uh, I don't think that's something that we uh, have a particular strong ethos for and maybe don't want a particularly like clear understanding of why the goose has written out a really nicely cursively scripted uh, <laughs> to-do list. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think to even pretend to know the like inscrutable will of a goose is, mm. is not really what we're going for. That's Who, it. They're, they're, sorry. Yep. There are like weird lines in the sand that we have to draw. Like the goose can turn on a tap but like we've talked about like is there a musical instrument and can the goose play that and like what are the limits of what we think this hypothetical goose can and can't intelligently do probably can't drive a car but but definitely could release a parking brake oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <coughs> what's the um, how do you visualize the final product and will you ever join a band of keys and attack people together? <laughs> Is it a multiplayer game? I don't know if we're ready to answer that yet. Um, we might have to be super vague. I'm very sorry. Uh, it will probably be released at some point in the future <laughs> and it will be maybe a little bit bigger or smaller <laughs> than it is at the moment. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're working towards putting more people in the game. Yeah. Um, we hope for some kind of storybook village, uh, like those TV shows that we showed you. Yeah, the more um, that we can execute on that big dancing parade of like specific people with like interesting jobs and stuff. Oh, they'll dance? Yeah, they'll dance. Yeah. Okay. Only when you get the little trumpet. <laughs> which it can't um, play. <laughs> are there plans to uh, accessorize the goose? Well, uh, we've, we've talked a bit about this. Um, like it didn't come up in the goose semiotics bit, but in that uh, uh, like list of uh, uh, sort of us riffing on the goose, one of the things is that it's only two colors. It's orange and white. Uh, and I am nervous about like messing with that beautiful iconography. Mm. I, I think the only way that someone that the goose would have an accessory is if it posed in a goose statue contest <laughs> and confused people and they thought it was a, the best goose statue and it won a little prize and would get a like a nice blue ribbon. Mm. Um, 
That's probably the only case that the goose would wear something though. Also, maybe it like runs through like a big laundry string and like has like a very large like brassiere on its head. Oh yeah. <laughs> I forgot that one. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the only two situations. Yeah. <laughs> what do the other goose verbs do? Like flapping? Uh, so it's actually... It's not in the game right now, I guess, because it was way was, too overpowered. Uh, yeah, it, was, it wasn't quite right for this build, um, but in some iterations of the game, and hopefully it's on its way back in, um, this just kind of makes you a bit more threatening and kind of intimidates people, making them keep a bit of distance from you. Um, <coughs> particularly if you can, like, charge at them and honk at the same <coughs> but yeah, One of these, yeah. <laughs> we're, like... We're, we're doing this thing where we, we we know what we want the goose to be able to do, and then we have to like retrofit what what how that should actually be justified in the mechanics. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd hope for the gardener to react to each individual thing that you can do uh, like fairly differently. Um, and at the moment, it's just not happening like we hope. So we took it out. Um, yeah, with that one particularly. The, the honk button is very useful. Like. Um, just having a get someone's attention button is a really nice thing. Like particularly if you go to one hiding place and then like you can get them to come over while you leave and like kind of swatch, swap places that way. Um, but yeah, part of our design philosophy with uh, the human character is that they're kind of a mirror of your verb set. Wh whatever you do and whatever kind of combination of things that you're doing, we just try and find a way to make them respond to that. Um, and that ends up kind of justifying all these different parts of being a goose that might not map so well to traditional video game verbs. Um, I think that's about all the time we have. Cool. Thank you guys so much. I do have one last, one last question. Does it have teeth? Uh, hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what do you... Should it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> All right then. Absolutely this is the not. one goose that actually doesn't have teeth. <laughs> just lovely, yeah. clean, nothing inside. Yeah, the just polygons. Out. Yeah, just nice. It's what you flat. think it looks like. Yeah, like those lovely ducks. <laughs> you guys, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, uh, uh.